Hi, and welcome to Chapter 7 of the Athena Protocol. Chapter 7 begins on page 94. The next morning, I go for a long run, first thing. It's a good way to get to know a place, and I've been neglecting my usual training regimen. Along the way, I stop at the main state registry building to see if I can find any information, ideally a home address, on the directors of Lovett, since my online trawling hasn't yielded, hasn't yielded anything new. I hand over the details of Mikhail Rostov, the Russian guy, and Katerina Volem, the Serbian girl, but apparently it takes 24 hours to lodge a request and have files brought up from storage. Seriously? Hasn't anyone heard of computer records? I fill in the required bits of paper and make an appointment to return the next morning. On my way back home, I pick up some bread, cheese, eggs, and a few other bits so I can make breakfast. After which, I get dressed in my favorite shirt, a soft blue one, and check myself in a chipped bathroom mirror. I'm not one for makeup or spending ages on my hair, but I want to look halfway decent today. What I see in the mirror is dark hair, green eyes, and Kit's nose, which she considers to be one of my best features, unlike my mouth, which she describes as sullen. Maybe that's for my father. I bring myself back to the task at hand and smile at my reflection. My whole face changes. For the better, I'll admit. I have a big smile, wide enough that it used to make me feel self-conscious, but people are always telling me they like it. By people, I mean a couple of guys who wanted to go out with me. One at school, one at this programming class I did on weekends. When you're genuinely not interested, it's amazing how people are attracted to you. I go back to my computer and tune in to listen for any Athena chatter, but nobody's online, it seems. Then I hang around by my window, waiting for Paulina Pavlik to arrive at the gallery, which she does at about the same time as she did yesterday. I look down onto the street as she goes through the same bribery routine with the traffic cop. Then I head down to the gallery and take my time to settle in at a table in the coffee area, rummaging in my bag. I pull out the expensive camera I bought right before leaving London. Carelessly, I place it on the edge of the table. Then I switch on my iPad, yawn gently, and start to read. Within a few minutes, a polite guy in a half apron arrives beside me. Irritably, I look up from my reading and snap out a complex coffee order. He has a little trouble with it, but I've already gone back to my tablet and given him little option but to retreat back to the barista and interpret it as best as he can. When he returns, I throw a glance at the cup and shake my head. This isn't what I ordered, I say. Double shot cappuccino? The waiter stutters. Double macchiato, I say, a little too loudly. I make a show of tasting the coffee before pulling a face. Completely obnoxious. By now, the couple at the next table are watching me, and from the corner of my eye, I'm sure that I can see Paulina heading toward me. I just keep my eyes fixed on the waiter as he hastily removes the cup. Paulina doesn't come all the way to the table, though. She gets close enough to beckon to the waiter and then walks with him back to the coffee machine, where she edges out the barista and prepares the coffee herself, cool as a cucumber. I pretend to be surprised when the cup touches the table. I look up, and Paulina is looking down at me coolly, like she's daring me to make another scene. You're macchiato, Paulina says. Thank you, I say. Sorry to have troubled you. It's my job. Trouble? I ask, and Paulina smiles. It's like her surface composure splits open, allowing a tiny glimpse of a real person to peek through. Making sure my guests are happy, she replies. I take a sip of the coffee. Paulina appears in no hurry to leave. It's delicious, I tell her. I know. This time, I smile. At the arrogance. At the impressive self-assurance. I'm a bit out of my depth, to be honest. Not half as composed as Paulina herself. But I'd rather she didn't know that. I look around the gallery, giving myself time to get back in control. Is this your place? I ask. There's a very slight hesitation from Paulina, and then she nods. The photography is stunning, I say. Not a genius comment, but I'm working under pressure here. I choose it all myself, she says. You have good taste. Paulina smiles. I know. I hold her look, and it's exactly what I wanted. Without any words passing between us, the moments seem to stretch out into some quiet meaning until Paulina makes a conscious effort to look away. As I'd hoped, her gaze catches on the camera that sits on the table, and her face lights up. Is that a Flex 1201? she asks. 
Silently, I thank the universe for making Paulina a real photography geek and not just a rich girl with artistic pretensions. I pass her the camera. Her fingers explore the controls easily, as if they're familiar to her. You can't get this model here yet, she says. You're a photographer? She looks at me with total interest now. It's my passion, I lie. Not my profession. I'm still at university. Where? London, I reply, which is somewhat vague, as the University of London is made up of a ton of different colleges all over the place, but I'd rather avoid specifics for as long as possible. I miss London so much, Paulina says, breaking into a genuine smile. I was at school in England, and I went into the city as much as I could. I hold out my hand. Jessie. Paulina. As her hand takes mine, I'm surprised by a literal crackle of feeling in the touch between us. For a moment, I think it might just be in my head, because, let's face it, I'm more than a bit taken with Paulina's looks. But when I look at her, I can tell that she's felt it too. She stops being so perfect and in control just for a fraction of a second, but immediately she places down the camera and gives me a quick smile. Enjoy the coffee. It's on the house. There's no need, I start to say, but I stop because Paulina is already weaving her way between tables to the back of the room. Returning to my apartment, I run through that interaction with Paulina again and again in my head. That thing that happened when she took my hand. It's thrilling to think about, but it also freaks me the hell out. This is the daughter of a criminal and a woman who's becoming a major suspect, in my investigations at least. I don't want to feel anything at all when I think of her, except maybe disgust. I pace about for a few minutes, then sit down to work, but Paulina and her eyes and her smile keep hanging there, where my logic should be. That line I spun her about being a university student is partly true. I am registered, with a fake last name, on a master's degree course with a really good college in London. I'm sure the fact that their electronic engineering school got a shed load of new equipment from Lee must have helped. It gives me some semblance of a life, if anyone were to ask. Hala is registered as a cleaner with the company that handles Lee's office cleaning contracts, so when the asylum social workers come around, she has a legitimate job, and Caitlin is officially still Peggy's administrative assistant. I get back to work. I can't find anything strange about the Russian bank that Paulina's payments came from. It's big, well-known, not an obvious money laundry for gangsters. For a break, I scroll some more through Paulina's Instagram feed. It's her main social media presence and is refreshingly free of pouting selfies and heavy of photos on artwork. She follows lots of photographers, too. From my window, I peer down inside the gallery as best I can, but there is no sign of Paulina. I leave my building and walk away from the gallery until I find a small place that serves local food. I order some kind of steak special and watch the world go by outside the window while I eat. When I'm done, the waitress smiles at my clean plate and asks me if I want to try the homemade plum brandy. I decline, so she brings me a coffee instead and a slice of cake, even though I haven't asked for it. She's kind and really young, maybe 16. Gregory Pavlik would look at her and calculate the profit he could make from selling her. The thought bothers me. Every day we leave Gregory alone, another lot of girls gets trapped in his system. How many? I'm not sure, because the tentacles of a man like that go on and on. I finish up the coffee, pay the bill in cash, leaving a generous tip, and go back to my place. I'm deep in tracking a trail on Gregory's Russian connection when my earpiece sputters into life, more clearly than it has in ages. It's Hala's voice that I hear, crisp and loud, and she's speaking in Arabic all of which is really weird. If she's having a personal call with someone, why would she be connected to her Athena mic? Unless she's flipped it to a different channel and just carried on talking because she's not bothered to take it out of her ear. Whatever it is, her voice sounds warm and happy. My first thought is that she has a secret boyfriend somewhere. But then she says the name Omar, and I realize that it must be her brother she's speaking to. She has one brother who wasn't home when the attack on her parents happened but he's still in the Middle East, as far as I know. I listen, unable to piece together more than a few fragments of the meaning, but Hala's voice has changed now. She feels stressed, under pressure, talking to him. 
I flick on an app on my computer that records the audio. The conversation goes for another 15 seconds before Hala hangs up. Immediately, I run the bit I taped through an online audio translator. I get back something like this. Omar, what time do you start work? Hala, I have the late shift. Her brother thinks she's a cleaner, so this makes sense, and I suppose it's even true, except that she will be gathering evidence from deep inside Gregory's illegal trafficking facility while Omar thinks she will be mopping floors in an office building somewhere. But then his tone changes. You said you would help me. I need time, Hala replies, to plan things. The next part doesn't translate well, but Omar's asking her something, insistent, pressuring her. Hala rushes him off the phone and hangs up. I sit back and stare at the screen for a bit, then I go and boil the kettle for tea. I don't know what to think about that little exchange. If her voice wasn't so stressed, I'd chalk it up to a million and one meaningless things. Maybe it's all fine. Maybe what's bugging me is that once, if there was anyone she would have confided in, it was me. I stand up and stretch and put Hala out of my mind. Keeping the lights off, I glance out of the window as I close the curtains. The gallery is dark now, with only picture lights illuminating one or two dramatic pieces of photography. A few people come and go on the street, and at a co- at a cafe across the way, four men sit outside smoking and talking. The summer night air is cool. On a motorcycle, it'll feel colder, so I put on my leather jacket before I go out. My first stop is one of Belgrade's trendiest bars. My remote snooping around Paulina's phone has yielded the fact that she's meeting some friends there tonight. Since this is a relatively small city, and since the cool places to hang out are mainly in one tiny section of it, I don't think it would be weird for me to bump into her there. The place is filling up by the time I arrive. I install myself at the impressive bar, featuring a wall of mirrors, which gives me an excellent view of the whole place including Paulina's table, which is perhaps the largest in the room. She's sitting with a man, she's sitting with three other people, a young couple holding hands and a man who feels a bit older, but who I can only see in profile. Since I'd rather engineer this whole meeting to look completely random, it's better not to rush things. So I order a sparkling water and exchange a few words with the two young guys standing next to me, just to blend in. They speak good English and are funny and easy to talk to, and the conversation flows so well that when I feel a delicate touch on my back, it literally makes me jump. I turn on my seat to find Paulina standing there. It's Jessie, right? She looks incredible. A crimson shirt, faded jeans, a slim gold chain around her neck. I nod and her face lights up in this big smile like I've made her night just by existing. She reminds me who she is and where we met. I pretend to remember. Of course, I say. Let me buy you a drink. Are you on your own? She asks with a quick glance at the young men who are talking to me, but who are now mostly just staring at her. I assure her I'm alone, and we go through this little charade where she asks me to join her table, and I tell her I couldn't possibly intrude, and then she insists. I follow her over there. Jessie, me, Lika, and Maria, friends of mine who just got married. The couple wave at me and kiss each other. They're still in their romantic stage, Paulina says, smiling at me. Both Paulina and I look away from them, to the older man. He's lean, his suit perfectly cut, his hair sprinkled with flecks of gray that brings out crisp blue eyes. I feel my stomach drop. Holy crap, I wasn't expecting this. Papa, this is my friend Jesse, Paulina says. I shake hands because it's an automatic reflex, but I am so surprised I could fall over. I look down at the manicured fingers of Gregory Pavlik, clasping my hand in his own. He looks much better than his photos. He's also smaller than I expected, with a refined appearance. Not the muscle-bound, towering hulk that I had imagined, working his way up in the world from those despair-soaked high-rises. Good to meet you. He says in heavily accented English. I smile politely. Where are you from? He asks. London. Holiday? His blue eyes never waver from mine. Cold, of course. Yes. Why Belgrade? Good question, Gregory. Because I want to crush you and your filthy business activities over the course of the next few days. 
I promised myself to visit every capital in Eastern Europe before I turned 21. I lie. Already bored with me, he moves aside to offer me his seat, and I slide into the, be- into the booth. Then he nods at all of us and says something in Serbian, taking his leave. The young couple urge him to stay, but he declines. Thank God. My father just came to have a drink with me, Paulina explains, for my benefit. I never see her, says Gregory. Except that we live in the same house, says Paulina dryly. Gregory says something affectionate to his daughter in reply. Uh, And his hand comes up to caress her hair gently. She pulls away very slightly. Is she repelled by him or just embarrassed? Gregory turns and walks away, preceded by a bodyguard in a black suit. In his wake trails a head waiter, hurrying to keep up. I watch as Gregory reaches the door. A coat is produced, and cash tips are handed out before he exits into, I assume, a waiting limo. When I look back at Paulina, her eyes are on me. Your dad seems great, I say. What does he do? All sorts of business. I don't keep track. She takes a breath in, as if tired suddenly. What about the gallery? That's mine, she says. I always wanted to have my own thing. But using his cash, I think to myself. Why? I ask. She hesitates. Parents put pressure on you, and my father is powerful. I want some independence. The gallery seems to be busy, I say encouragingly. It's mainly coffee. The art sales make the real income, but Belgrade is limited for that, not like Moscow or London. She's trying to bring me into the conversation, but that mention of Moscow has me on edge. I have to try hard to jump. I have to try hard not to jump straight into it. Instead, I leave a small silence, like I'm interested, but not that much. What do your parents do? Paulina asks me. I take a moment to erase Kit from my mind and replace her with someone imaginary, based on Lee. My mother made money in technology. She's retired now. Having seen just a little bit of Paulina's high-end world, I decide she might feel more comfortable knowing I'm used to wealth and privilege, not overwhelmed by it. The other couple surfaces from their endless kissing, so Paulina turns her attention to them. There are a few, min- a few minutes during which we all chat together and order more drinks. After that, I steer the conversation again. You mentioned Moscow. I'm thinking of visiting. It's great. Paulina says, smiling. You've been there twice this year already, but for, I've been there twice this year already, but for work mainly. What work? I ask, wondering why she's being so open about it. She looks at me, surprised. The gallery, she says. I listen as she continues. I've been working with a few art spaces in Moscow, getting them interested in the young Belgrade photographers I show here. Good idea, I say. How's it going? Really well. They already bought a lot of artwork at really high prices. I mean, they're good prices, but sometimes the Russians have more money than cents. I smile, and Paulina holds my look, like we're sharing a joke. Sorry. As I take in her open gaze, part of me is totally relieved that there is a real, honest explanation for those trips to Moscow, and for all that money in her account and that she's clearly working to earn her own living, away from Gregory's businesses. Paulina is beautiful and self-assured and perfectly turned out, but despite all that, I can't help but like her. Part of me is relieved that she seems to be, as Thomas put it, squeaky clean. I look around the bar, trying to stop myself from just staring at her, because she is pretty amazing to look at. Popular place, I comment. She nods. Belgrade is small. There are maybe two places where anyone who's anyone goes for drinks, and this is one of them. We talk for a while longer, and as Paulina speaks, she leans into me, to be sure I can hear her over the loud music that pounds in the background. She's very close, and the warmth and the warmth and the scent of her are making me forget what I was doing here to begin with. Maybe a little abruptly, I excuse myself and head to the bathroom, fighting through the ever-growing crowd. I take my time in there, calming down, giving myself a moment to get centered again. Exiting the toilet stall, I wash my hands and check myself in the mirror. Be charming, Jesse. You're in control. And remember who she is. The door of the bathroom opens, and just my luck, 
Paulina comes in. I smile. So does she. I wait for her to go into the stall, but she doesn't. She just she just stands next to me. What is it? I ask, a bit thrown. Are you okay? You got up so fast. I'm fine. Are you? She's standing a bit too close to me. Not too obvious, but a tiny bit inside my personal space. Not that I mind it. At all. You always answer a question with a question, Paulina says, her eyes smiling. Do I? I ask, and we both laugh. The bathroom door opens again, and it's weird, but we both step away from each other, like we were up to something, even though we weren't. The woman who comes in walks straight to the stall at the end of the, at the end and cl- the woman who comes in walks straight to the stall at the end and closes the door. I look at Paulina. She's touching up her lipstick now, but her eyes meet mine in the mirror, and she smiles. The breeze is cool, verging on cold. But it feels good to be outside and alone as I get onto my motorbike. I made myself leave the bar after another 20 minutes. I have a task to complete tonight and hanging out over drunks hanging out over drinks with a girl I can find nothing incriminating on is probably not enough not a good enough reason to skip it. The bike handles reasonably well, and anyway, I'm not trying to break any speed records. I just want to drive out to where Gregory has his horrible trafficking operation. A few cars come and go through the tower blocks of New Belgrade, but there aren't many people on the street except a couple of women who hang around in short skirts and makeup, looking for passing trade. I'm almost relieved to get past the high-rises, and then a small area of suburb and onto an open road with nothing on one side but scrubby wasteland that provides more thickly wooded that becomes more thickly wooded as I ride. There's something soothing about the dull roar of an engine. I ride the motorcycle at a steady speed and the noise washes my mind clean. It's a moment of release. For a few moments I forget about Paulina. I forget about Ahmed and what happened in Africa, and I stop worrying about what will happen in this week. Then the red line on my phone's map shifts to show an imminent left turn, and I slow the bike so I can find the turnoff. When I see it, a thin trail of gravel, I slide onto it and drive through the woods slowly, weaving past potholes. At a small break in the woodland, I stop the bike and swing down off it. Ahead of me, a a brick wall flower, a brick wall towers above the trees. A few security lights are perched on top of the bricks, nestled in among barbed wire. From this angle, I can can only see the top floors of the abandoned hospital rising behind it. Dark windows that you can't see into, and an aura of despair. On foot, I track back to the main road, from where I came. Behind me, there's a sound, and I spin around quickly. But it's nothing. The woods are full of creaking, cracking twigs, and the and the rustling of small animals. But now I can hear something more, an engine coming down the road toward me. I stay back, well hidden, and watch as it passes. White, no markings, standard supply truck. I make a mental note of the make of the vehicle and watch as it all as it goes all the way to the end of the road. I made sure enough to wear the zoom contact lens we used in Cape, in Cameroon. So with just a couple of blinks, I can get a much better look at what's happening without having to get too close. The truck stands there, waiting, by a massive metal gate. As it opens, four men come into view, hanging around, watching, cradling automatic weapons in their arms, just like that, not even trying to hide them. But then... But then, who would they be trying to hide from? There's nobody out here, and the police probably know enough, or are paid enough by Gregory. I want to keep well, aw- uh, to keep well away. I try to glimpse. A- I try to get a glimpse of what's behind the gate, but I can't see much except a lit up loading bay and a greenish light in a corridor. The place looks huge, and I wonder how many women Gregory has in there, and what he releases them to. A life of slavery to be used in whatever way yields him the biggest profit. I'm walking back to the bike as quietly as I can when I hear something else. 
from above like a bird. But it's nighttime, and it feels weird that there should be a bird rustling up there. I look up, and it's too late. Something big and heavy falls onto me, and I crash to the ground. Sorry for those few places I had a little bit of trouble losing my spot. All right, we will pick up in the next video at chapter 8. Bye.